This week, Michael and I interview James Gellert, the chairman and CEO of Rapid Ratings. Startup articles this week include drone catchers, stopping or slowing the growth of your business, getting your employees to move away, more tips for creating a great pitch deck, and fighting analysis paralysis. In startup news, Cloudera, Walmart, and Okta. We'll update you on our own startup journeys, so stay tuned for this episode of Startup Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show about security startups, how to secure your startup, and advice for security startups, it's Startup Security Weekly. I need it from the top. Brought to you by Gain Control of Cyber Risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh asset based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Welcome to Startup Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, for April 7th, 2017. This is episode 34, and I'm reporting from lovely Rhode Island. Welcome on the lines via Skype, the beach bum himself, just coming <laughs> back from InfoSec 2017. Mr. Michael Santarcangelo, welcome to the show. It is Always good. I prefer seeing you in person, man. It was great catching up this week. Yeah, well, I don't feel like we didn't spend nearly enough time we together. Didn't. Well, what's interesting is good, though, because we spent time with other people that we normally spend less time with. And because you and I get to talk every week, at least. So, yeah, in fact, I think we commented on that when, when we got that brief time to catch up. I'll tell you, this was one of those rare times where I really didn't expect to be busy. And I ended up with my days and nights pretty full. And it, it was great. I wanted to point something out, too, because I thought about this, and as a compliment to you, but also my approach, you and I made ourselves very accessible. We didn't get the time we were hoping for to talk to each other, but man, I had some absolutely great conversations. We were talking to everyone else at the conference, which is interesting. That's kind of how it should be, right? Yeah. And you and I know each other, right? So, yeah, we can, we'll can we hang out some other time when there's not well, other people around that we want to talk to, basically. And, you know, I mean, you're Paul Asadorian. You're pretty famous. and and But yet, there that, you are, but... sitting down there talking to everybody and, and making yourself accessible. And I, that, I, I don't think people realize that. Like, it's not like, oh, look, that's Paul. He doesn't have time for us. Dude, you're... You're right in the middle of it, talking to anybody who comes by, and I. It's one of the reasons I, I like being on the show floor, uh, Michael. You know, to talk to not just the listeners but other vendors, to talk to everyone. Right? I mean, that's really been my conference kind of thing. Is I I spend it largely in the the vendor area um, where I commiserate with everyone, which is good. It's good. It's all good. Um, yeah. So uh, why don't you introduce our special guest for today, Michael? Yeah. So James Gellert. Uh, he runs a really cool company. He's got a neat background, so we'll ask him about that in a second. But he runs a company called Rapid Ratings. And it, as we know, one of the areas important in our organization today is risk. I, I talk about the one risk conversation. So we've looked at things like cyber insurance. We've looked at third-party risk. We look at all sorts of different things. And what Rapid Ratings does is it looks at the financial health of companies. And the more I've talked to James, he's, he's given me a lot of tidbits. So we're going to go through some of those uh, as we talk through some of this today. But you're, you guys are also going to see he's got a fantastic voice and he's better to look at than Paul and I. So James, welcome to the program and thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. That's a hell of a buildup though. Yeah, no pressure, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just have to keep keep talking and not drool on myself. So, give us a little bit of a of a background. Uh, like, tell us first what Rapid Ratings is, and then give us some idea into kind of how you ended up there. Sure. So, Rapid Ratings is a quantitative system that evaluates financial health of companies, and we do that on behalf of clients in a subscription SaaS-based business, where our clients range from corporations like the GEs of the world to uh, the largest financial institutions uh, of the world as well. Everyone's looking at enterprise risk and counterparty risk and trying to get more transparency and visibility into the companies that they work with. 
could be their suppliers, could be their vendors, could be their customers, could be companies they're lending to or investing in. So it's a broad, broad range of types of entities out there that need to have better understanding of who they're working with and who they're taking risks of, commercial risk or financial risk. And what we do is provide transparency through the financial health rating by being able to uh, use financial statements either publicly disclosed from public filers or we get the private company data from private companies and we're able to provide the transparency into both for our clients and we're doing this by the thousands for our clients Um, my personal background was originally as a banker uh, then became an entrepreneur and uh uh, start, worked in a variety of companies as interim or full-time uh, senior management. One of the companies I started was a small uh, investment banking boutique to help small to mid-sized companies construct themselves uh, to do business development relationships, expand sales forces, uh, raise capital, do M&A, things like that. And uh, we, had my longtime business partner, Douglas Cameron, and I uh, were working in financial technology and information services companies uh, in that industry for quite some time and had a real specialization in it. And Rapid Ratings came along as a prospective client of ours. We ended up teaming with the original founder, Dr. Patrick Caragata, and bought the company off of a business he had sold it to and we moved it to the U.S. from Australia, and we've been expanding it here ever since. That's that's really fascinating. Like I, I've I've got a ton of questions. I mean, Paul, this is something burning because we can also go to some of the things he shared that I think are, are really relevant. Yeah, uh, James, in consulting with with companies about their overall financial health or business growth, like what are the what are the top themes that you pull from that uh, people can just do better uh, in business? Well, look, I I think the the biggest focus that people can have is on recognizing that there's a commercial value to transparency and being able to promote with one's counterparties that sharing information about themselves, whether it's on their security protocols, whether it's on the technology platform that they use, whether it's their financial statements, but being able to share that information can develop a closer relationship that has commercial benefits to both sides. And so my answer is really to both sides of that conversation, those who are needing, wanting, and looking for information and those who are being asked for it. At the end of the day, Both sides benefit if there's a sharing of information and if it's done in a trusted, secure way and the analysis is fair. And I think that's really what we're finding, whether we're talking to the the, the biggest banks in the world or uh, or the Fortune 1000 manufacturing companies and and services companies and non-financials, or whether we're talking to small, young startup companies. It's recognizing that if you share information, you ask information, it can help with a dialogue between counterparties, you're benefiting both sides. Let me use it as a segue, because one of the things that, that was really interesting the first time you and I talked was, I said, okay, so how, how does this fit in security? What, what, you know, what does this matter? Most people who do third-party risk and security right now end up picking some sort of a framework, and then they feel they have this daunting task of, I have to create some sort of a questionnaire, I send it over to the company, hopefully they answer it, maybe they don't answer it to my liking, we go roundabout, and we give them a thumbs up, thumbs down, or something else in between. And you pointed out the role of financial health in helping to better understand their capacity to make some of those decisions without taking the whole speaking point away from you. So how does that factor in? How does If I'm looking at those counterparties and I'm looking at risks, how does financial health help me get a better understanding of what they're really able to do or not? So I think the, the, core, the core to that is really understanding that, uh, that these risk control areas that historically have been thought of as being silos, so security being mm-hmm. one, other IT being another, finance being another, whether someone, whether a company or management falls into liens and sanctions and foreign corrupt practices, hits and uh, any money laundering, and all these things that historically have been part of the sort of know your customer realm, that all of these things are, are somewhat intertwined and some are leading indicators of others. So for instance, a lot of our clients use us not instead of doing, uh, let's say, a cyber review on a company to see what kind of cybersecurity program they have in place, but in conjunction with that, understanding that security and finance are not separated. So a company with a stronger financial health is going to have greater flexibility, greater wherewithal, uh, greater uh, agility to be able to weather storms and shocks 
but also to be able to invest and continue to reinvest in their business. So a company that is a, that has weakening financial health and is a high risk or very high risk FHR company is one that people need to spend a little bit more time thinking whether or thinking through whether that company can continue to invest in maintaining and upgrading when needed let's say, a cybersecurity program. So doing an initial assessment of a, let's say, supplier, and then not returning to look at them again in a year or two years or even quarterly, depending on, on how well that company is doing, that's a real mistake. But being able to set risk uh, management programs in place that are systematic, that's really important. And being able to understand how these risks touch each other. And just as an, sorry, go ahead. No, that's that's an interesting point I hadn't thought about. So when you're looking at the financial health, you know, I, when I ask a lot of people, like, how often do you go back and look at the third party risk? And, you know, they usually tap dance a little bit and then kind of admit, well, as often as we can, but whatever. But like you're talking about like 90 day, you know, 180 day, 360 day cycles. So what do you recommend? Because financial health has a tendency to change perhaps a little quicker than did you write a policy or do you have these technologies in place? Right. So. And so, sorry to kind of focus on that, but what what would you recommend to somebody who's maybe going to start incorporating financial health into their assessment? When what's the optimal time to ask that? I think they need to first figure out what the operational needs are of the business and how many of the business units within a company are integrated into a program. So if you are just in your IT group nothing wrong with that. But if you're just in your IT group, you may have one very specific thing you need to do. If you are part of an enterprise risk or a third-party risk group, or you're part of a compliance group that needs to go cross-functionally uh, across different departments and different groups, then you probably have a different kind of a business objective in doing all of that risk management. So there isn't one way to incorporate uh, these risk factors and risk assessments. But what we find is a lot of our clients, whether they're corporations or financial institutions, will determine the, the frequency of monitoring a company now, let's call it their suppliers. They'll look at the frequency of monitoring those suppliers or vendors um, based on the criticality of them. And the criticality could be, do those third parties touch private information? Um, are, do they have access to, uh, to company systems? Do, they have, do the personnel have access to uh, the company's real estate? Uh, and are they a sole source supplier? Are they dual sourced? Do they have significant revenue impact or reputational impact if they fail? And then once that's segmented, determine uh, the frequency with which they want to do assessments. So they may want to assess every new third party. So let's say in the procurement process, they want to do an assessment of, of five as they're narrowing down to one. They bring in the one. It's a new supplier. They want to rate it and rate and continue to rate it, let's say, on an annual basis, unless it's highly critical or unless it is deteriorating. And if it's in our high risk or very high risk zones, that may trigger quarterly reviews. So it's really about what functionally works, who the third parties are and where they fit into the business, both in terms of the risks that the business takes with them and, uh, and whether they are, whether they are uh, a sole source type of an arrangement or not, and then operationalize it based on that. So I, 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 li I like this a lot. In your experience then, one of the things I'm, I'm realizing is there's typically a risk management group in an organization, and that's often different than the security group. And when we start talking about third-party risk, a lot of us right now are looking at it from a pure security perspective. And then what I'm learning more and more is that we're getting integrated with contracts and legal. We're getting integrated with the procurement process. How often in your experience then, some of those things that you pointed out around asking about the importance of the project, the importance of the relationship and those types of things, do you find those are usually already sorted out at some part in the organization? Because those are not questions I find security people tend to ask. So what I'm, tr what I'm trying to get to is, should we just go figure out who in the organization is already gathering that information? Or have you just given us something new to think about on the front end internally to calibrate how we better assess third-party risk and, and other types of things? 
Well, it's a great question because you know, companies are spread widely across the spectrum of yeah. sophistication of their internal programs and how much data is shared within them. But then there are a lot, and I find this more with the technology groups, particularly in financial institutions, but you still see it in, in corporations as well, where they have historically been asking for information. They're used to it, but they aren't necessarily used to sharing it nor are they necessarily used to relying on the information that is sourced by other parts of the organization. So you, we can find situations, uh, rapid ratings as a vendor to, uh, to companies, that we may be asked by a group, let's call it the third-party risk group, for uh, a questionnaire, and the questionnaire has a thousand questions. And 800 of them are basically tech and security related. And then we get the questionnaire after that from the technology group or the security group that asks another 500 questions, 400 and <laughs> four, 498 of which we've already answered. But because yeah. we answered them for another part of the organization, they don't satisfy hmm. the tech and the security group. So we have to do it again. And of course, there's slight nuances to them. So these are things that I think are really interesting for the industry uh, on both sides of it, both those who are asking these questions and the companies who have to put process in place to be able to talk about what's, what their security programs look like, as well as the other risk areas. But there's there's an inefficiency that over time has to get baked through, and uh, and we've got to have more efficiency in the process. And I and I'd say just as a sort of unsolicited advice for all the companies in the in the tech space that are going to sell, particularly into the banks, that getting them getting their their houses in order to be able to satisfy these kinds of questionnaires and be able to staff properly to be able to satisfy the review uh, that they will be put under is absolutely critical. And uh, they can easily trip themselves up and find that selling into the financial institutions is getting harder and harder if they're not geared for these kinds of reviews and periodic uh, refreshes of those reviews. James, did you start Rapid Ratings uh, yourself? I saw a note in here that said you brought it to the U.S. Was this a, a company that you uh, started from the ground up or? No, a gentleman named Patrick Caragata, uh, PhD in economics, he really started it, and he started it uh, when he was down yeah. in uh, in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we, my business partner and I, bought the company and moved it to the U.S. So it was around before uh, before we picked it up. Uh, but when we did, it was right before the financial crisis. So really interesting <laughs> of time. Course. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Every, mm -hmm. Everyone sh everyone should do that before a major crisis. Uh, but it, well, hold well, on, I want to talk about that for a second because um, okay. advisors will will tell you that uh, when you start a business, if you started in hard financial times, you pick up really good lessons. Um, so that when you do reach really good times, you've learned those harder lessons. I think it really relates to what what you do today, James. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, look, being able to, it's very different to start up a company uh, or restart up a company when you have to run it in a lean fashion, mm. because that becomes part of your DNA. If you're given a ton of capital at the outset, and like a lot of uh, like a lot of companies are today. Started up with if they're started up with a tremendous amount of venture funding, there's a uh, there's almost an ethic to burn that capital to grow as fast as possible. But that may not necessarily be long term in the best interests of the company, particularly in terms of the the philosophical underpinnings of that company and how it runs itself. So I think being lean early uh, does institute a lot of. Uh, of long-term efficiency, but at the same time, you've got to be able to to adapt to your circumstances. In our case, getting through the financial crisis was, of course, challenging because we were a young company at the time, but all of the things that caused the financial crisis and all of the things that companies had to adapt themselves to post-crisis have been excellent for us because they've all been about understanding and managing risk more and better. Mm -hmm. and fit right into that because we have a scalable, secure solution for doing things that uh, that most companies never really thought they could do, in particular, being able to get access to and understanding private company information. And you know, the uh, if we look at all of our clients across all industries, I would say that probably 80, maybe even slightly higher than 80% of all of their third parties are private companies. And we're talking about the the largest companies in the world, their counterparty groups, customers and suppliers, 
private companies. And historically, there wasn't really a, uh, a process in place or an understanding that uh, getting transparency and sharing information between a private company or from a private company to a customer or supplier uh, was, uh, was a viable thing to do. And I think we've really forged new ground there by being able to leverage the fact that in this new world post-crisis, understanding counterparty risk transparency, all of that is new and it's critically important. And everyone is understanding it, whether they're reluctantly coming along or not, but, uh, but we're doing an awful lot to, uh, to move people in that direction. No, I love that. You know, there's, there's a book out uh, that I got recommended called Play Bigger. Have you read it? No, well, I don't even I know, know if, 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 yeah, I don't know if I've recommended it yet, even on this program. I'm halfway through it. I'm comfortable to say total recommendation, but you just said something that triggered that in me, uh, which is, you know, you're solving a problem people didn't even know that they could solve. Yep, there you go. That's that's how you can go create a new category. So it's interesting, right? Because you're you're doing these these rapid ratings. You're looking at financial health. You're doing it quantitatively, right? So my, my background is economics. I don't have a PhD. I'm not really fancy with it. I just happen to like it. So th- these are a lot of the things that kind of appeal to me, and and we talk about then how you bring that in and how you engage. So let me ask some other questions then. Who do you tend to find that you're selling to? So when you go to the, I mean, are you predominantly working with enterprises? Yeah, so we sell to enterprises, not to individuals. Uh, Our clients range from the supply chain and procurement parts of businesses to finance and credit. So imagine a company yeah. that's that's evaluating all of its supply suppliers when they're coming on board, when they're looking for a new supplier, or on an ongoing basis. Uh, clients are uh, are uh, credit teams that are evaluating customers that they are uh, that they are selling to and setting pricing and terms for. Uh, we have banks that uh, are evaluating third party risk, which is a regulatory requirement now, and that's a huge, uh, very interesting category. I, and I hear I hear the groan. I hear a lot of groans about. No, that. it was more of it. Yeah, I mean, I get the groans, but I mean, I, I, I get it, right? Because those are always drivers. I mean, if you're a business and there's a regulatory need for it and you can provide that solution, it's really kind of cool. But what I'm also hearing is there's there's no one target profile that you can go out and reach. There's there's a bunch. And security is starting to filter up into it a little bit. So it's interesting. One of the things you and I talked about before, and we touched on it here, but I kind of want to go back into it. From a third-party risk perspective, um, Understanding the financial health really matters, and what we've kind of found. So we, Paul, just brought up the, the all of the financial crisis and all of the the conversations around that. But we've also watched a very unnatural amount of liquidity and of, of financial supply. Money's been easy to come by for the last couple of years, and I'm. It looks like that's going to start to tighten up. Do you, that's something I actually picked up from you. So uh, do you still agree with that? And if so, what does that mean? What does that mean for startups? And what does that mean then if you're working with a company? Like, why now does their financial health matter? Because how long are they going to hold on? Like, what what do we need to think about relative to money supply and ease of access to capital and how that might change? So, uh, great question and absolutely still totally applicable. Uh, And I think, uh, let me just start by by completing a, uh, a thought from from the prior question when you when you indicated uh, that there are a lot of different pockets and a lot of different areas that for instance we're talking to or that are concerned with this I actually think about it in terms of uh, it's being very common and that uh, the the common denominator is being able to understand companies the common denominator for us is the financial health rating as this ubiquitous measure of how well a company is doing long term and short term and uh, a key component to that, to your to your most recent question, is how can that company continue to grow? How can it sustain itself? And depending on where a company is in its life cycle and what industry it's in, it may be more reliant on the equity markets, particularly the private and the venture equity markets or the angel market, uh, even earlier in the life cycle, all the way through to the capital markets. And I really do see it not as a perfect continuum, but if you think of angel and venture and p- perhaps private equity or later stage venture, you think of bank financing, you think of credit facilities from non-banks, whether they're private equity credit funds or whether mm-hmm. they're part of this newer world of alternative credit providers, uh, hedge funds and others. And then it's, of course, the bond markets, both the high yield and the investment grade bond markets, public and private markets. That's a broad range of capital markets areas that people can tap into. But you're absolutely right that the biggest uh, dynamic in the market over the last really nine years has been 
much more availability of capital. And with quantitative easing, low interest rates, that has created a dynamic in the market where institutional investors have chased yield because they're not getting the typical historical yields that they were getting by taking, let's say, medium risk. And so they're having to take much, much higher risks to get the same or still not even as good yields. That means they're chasing companies to invest in them. And companies that Mm. uh, 10 years ago or even seven years ago weren't able to raise capital today and over the last few years have been able to raise capital at ease as much as they want, low interest rates, and even Uh, even some longer terms to that debt. Now, the problem with that is that as rates continue to rise, and we've already started to see the Fed's bias towards, towards increasing rates, as rates rise, that normalizes a bit. And we are likely to see more volatility in the market, a higher default rate, because companies that were able to refinance uh, or finance for the first time and now have uh, amounts due in 2018, 2019, 2020, then they may not be able to refinance that. And understanding their financial health, understanding their credit quality will be a key determinant in whether people are aligned with those companies that can survive and refinance or they are overweighted to companies that can't. And then they're going to have more defaults in their suppliers and, and so forth. That really kind of slides all the way down into uh, into the equity markets where you're seeing you know, later stage venture, uh, more venture in private equity, large funds being raised. You're seeing peop- uh, companies companies waiting longer before they IPO because the IPO market has been for the last really year to two, well, year and a half has been uh, very volatile. And uh, if we see more equity volatility come, which we will, because we're going to see more volatility in the credit markets come, and we will, uh, that's going to trickle on down. You're going to see it affect companies all through the spectrum. That's interesting. So I have a question on funding, but then what it means from us, from a, if we're going to go back to classic security third party risk, a company that today looks healthy may not have the money to pay their insurance premiums in a couple months. They may not have the money to go make that investment that we're counting on them to make to upgrade the infrastructure, otherwise protect it. And it's not because they don't care or they don't understand. It's because they're really financially constrained in a way that they haven't been in a number of years. That. A fair, a fair way to at least put a thought into people's heads. It, it is, and and I would add to it that particularly in in I think a lot of the the market that um, that are paying really close attention to these issues on the security side, the earlier stage in the startup world, it's not just a question of whether they can be giant capital markets issuers. But a company that someone wants to work with today and is therefore doing a heavy security review on, in a year's time, if that company can't refinance whatever debt it's got or it can't do the next equity round at uh, at an attractive enough price, or perhaps it did a preferred round at one point and the the preferred investors are holding them up and don't want to give permission for uh, for a new capital raise, you start to take on other event risk. You take on the event risk that senior management could uh, could decide they don't want to be there anymore. They leave or they get replaced or shareholders get diluted. When shareholders get diluted with a low round, a uh, low val round, you could see the people who were uh, the employees who were in charge of security realizing they're diluted and they want and they're not interested in staying there anymore. Or or they may demand more, but you get more tumult in a company that uh, that creates problems that are associated with the security risks that you were originally evaluating, but they're not actually the security risks anymore. It's sprinkled over into a, into a variety of other things. If you're not paying attention to all of these things and how they affect a company and a company's ability to grow, you may have spent a tremendous amount of time and done an excellent review on a company's uh, security, and that's the least of your problems. So then, is this also why we're starting to see, I mean, if if we go back even two or three years, we'd say your seed round was a quarter of a million dollars, maybe half a million. Now we're seeing seed rounds of a million, million and a half, two million, two and a half million. So is some of that, that not the volatility that's coming, but it was because there was so much money and people were chasing that that almost led to, um, I got to go figure something out. Because we've always heard it as pressure as, well, uh, I'm more judicious now. And so therefore, I'll give you a higher round, but I'm expecting more. So I want, but but listening to you today, I almost started to realize, no, there's a, there's a second part to this. There was enough money around that 
I was trying to make bigger bets to try to get a bigger return instead of settling for some sort of a mediocre return. Is there a connection there or am I just, you know, it's a Friday and I'm probably not paying enough attention. <laughs> uh, I, it's definitely a Friday, but I think you're paying attention. I, look, I, I think there's a, I think there's an element of it. Uh, I do think people are uh, perhaps diversifying a little bit less instead of putting uh, fifty thousand yeah. dollars into ten investments. They're, you know, they're doing a few at a couple hundred, and uh, you're also seeing. Look, if you go back to sort of the the bubble period, uh, kind of ninety nine two thousand, the angel market, you know, where a lot of people who were just so enthusiastic to be involved that they would chuck ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars into uh, into young companies, startup companies, and now you don't have quite that same sort of. Mm-hmm. smaller bite size base and but you do have people who have made a tremendous amount of money and are you know are more prepared to write the two three four hundred thousand dollar check but it's going to come with terms and those terms are going to maybe give them rights to you know rights of refusal on the next investment or whatever it may be they may be getting a preferred instead of common at the beginning um, there are a lot of companies that will only raise common for you know for an extended period of time and then the first preferred uh, as an institutional investor you know comes mm-hmm. in and kind of changes that cap structure and the thinking around it. So I think those, there are a lot of dynamics that uh, that have to do with, you know, bite size and, and how much control people are getting. Oh, that's fascinating. Paul, I, I know I've kind of monopolized this. Uh, no, you're doing great. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't have any further uh, questions. Michael, I mean, I this if you is, have a this closing is, this question is, for this James. This is the stuff I tend to geek out on, so I, I, I really, I enjoy this side of it. I, I find it's absolutely fascinating. James, if, if you, knowing what you know now, um, especially like right, m- migrating a company, all the time you spent in M&A, all the things you look at now, somebody sitting here listening to us, and we just said words that are typically scary to people. There's volatility. We're going to see t- credit tightening up. Somebody out there today wants to start a startup. What would you tell them? What What should they think about? What What's something that could guide them to success? Oh gosh, I think there's the, the, there are a lot of things um, that have to do with funding. How you how you set the capital and the capital tone in your company. Um, I think a lot of early stage um, entrepreneurs are really frightened by dilution and mm-hmm. probably go longer than they should, uh, bringing in outside capital. And I also think there are a lot of entrepreneurs who come out with a conviction that their idea, their way of wanting to do things has to be the way it's done. And at the end of the day, you know, there are the, the numbers of the numbers of entrepreneurs who have been wildly successful by not being agile, not being nimble, not taking advice, not taking outside money. It's just a very, very small group. So finding the balance between having the courage of your convictions for what you originally want to do and set out to do, and being able to blend that with advice and the reality that you find and discover as you get out on that road, talking to prospective customers, talking to prospective employees, talking to prospective investors. You really need to be able to sponge all of that in and figure out the, the proper way of being able to, to balance all of that. And then I think in my experience in the, in the various companies that I've run is you've got to accept that and not accept, you've got to embrace the fact that every day you are going to do 10 things only two of which you had planned and the other eight that you had (laughs) planned, you're not getting to. And of the 10 things that you do, probably half of them you have experience and are qualified to do and the other half you don't. And you've got to be able to figure it out. And uh, if you go in expecting that you're going to be able to plan every day and everything is going to go exactly as you expect, you're going to be wildly disappointed. If you go in excited about the new challenges, as well as getting the things done that you thought you had to get done. That's a really good perspective for uh, for going in and executing on a day-to-day plan. I like that. I like that a lot. As always, I enjoy talking with you. Um, Thank you. Me too. We covered a lot of ground today, so it's awesome. And uh, I really appreciate you joining us on the program. Yeah, James, thank you very much for appearing on Startup Security Weekly. Stay tuned. Coming up next... Michael and I are going to cover some startup articles, some startup news, and talk about our journeys. Don't go anywhere. 